Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Sorry for the slight delay. I think we're about a minute behind schedule here, um, but we're uh, very excited to bring uh, this uh, to con this continuation of our FASD screening tools webinar series. Uh, the webinar today is uh, is on the maternal drinking history guide uh, tool, and um, just to remind people that uh, this is part of the CAFC's uh, uh, FASD screening tool kit, which can be found on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, and we'll be, be, we will be sure to put information up uh, after this webinar about how you can access that toolkit. Uh, it's easy to find if you go to ken.cafc.org, that's ken.cafc.org, and just search around and you'll find not only the toolkit, but a whole series of webinars related to the toolkit itself, screening for FASD in general, and all and individual webinars about all of the tools. Um, so without, uh, or so, and uh, if you've attended our webinars before, you'll know that uh, we do have question and answer through uh, during the, or well, at the end of this presentation, since we only have one speaker. Uh, and in order to ask your questions, we ask you to type them into the question box. And I always ask, uh, always suggest to people that you type them in as you think of them. Don't feel you need to wait until the end of the session uh, to type your questions. Uh, type them in as you think of them. That way you don't forget them. And we will be able to sort of better understand at what point during the presentation these questions are coming in. And it might help us uh, more easily answer the questions for you. Uh, so with all that being, oh, and we do record the uh, these sessions, and we do post them again on the Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. And following this uh, presentation, at within after a couple of days, you will receive an automatic message from us uh, that has a link to the uh, recorded presentation, as well as the uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint slides and that sort of thing. And any other resources or links or documents that are associated with this webinar, we'll put all that on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so with all that being said, I'm, it's my pleasure to hand over the virtual podium to CAFC's president and CEO, Elaine Orbein, to uh, introduce our, uh, the, today's topic and uh, our, our uh, presenter. Over to you, Elaine. Thanks so much, Doug, and good morning and uh, good afternoon in some parts of the country to everyone uh, and uh, a very warm virtual welcome to all. Um, this morning, as Doug mentioned, is, uh, is a very important um, milestone in, in our work um, associated to uh, CAFC's National Screening Toolkit for Children and Youth Identified and Potentially Affected by Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Um, just before I introduce our colleague and, uh, and speaker, Momita Sarkar, I did want to acknowledge the partnership and the, um, uh, the organization, the Public Health Agency of Canada that has been a long-standing partner with CAFC in the work that's been ongoing since 2007, this particular work. And uh, I also want to recognize our National Steering Committee for their leadership and content expert uh, expertise. So Charlotte Rosenbaum is part of our steering committee. Uh, Charlotte is our um, project lead and uh, is, uh, is with us on, uh, on today's webinar. So the title today that we're going to be focusing in on is how to ask effective, how to ask effective approaches to address maternal drinking in clinical settings. And uh, it is my pleasure at this point to first of all acknowledge uh, the leadership and the um, the expertise that our speaker, Momita Sarkar, has brought uh, to this work. Uh, Momita has over 10 years of professional experience in diverse areas such as health and education and prevention strategies. Uh, this encompasses research, coordination, presentations, and publications. Uh, since 2000, Momita has held the position of coordinator for the alcohol and substance use Helpline with the Mother Risk Program at the Hospital for Sick Children, Momita, holds a PhD from the Institute of Medical Sciences at the University of Toronto with a collaborative degree in addiction medicine. Additionally, she has a Master's of Science degree from the Faculty of Pharmacy at University of Toronto. A Momita's doctoral thesis focused on the use of evidence-based screening strategies to identify women exposed to alcohol and other recreational drugs. This led to the development of the Maternal History Guide that will be and has been incorporated into 
CAPSI's uh, Canadian FASD Screening Toolkit. Momita, I want to thank you for your longstanding collaboration, leadership, and participation in this um, very important work. And it's my pleasure to turn our virtual podium over to you. Thank you, Lane. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So today I will be discussing the Maternal Drinking History Guide as part of the National FASD Toolkit. Um, the, the main, the, before I begin anything, I'd like to first present this case so you can keep that in mind as I go through the information. Here's an infant born at 35 weeks of gestation with severe endotrine growth retardation and low APGAR scores, poor tonus and poor suckling. The medical history of birth mother fail to reflect any exposure to um, any substances that would be related to the uh, baby symptoms. Patient denies use of any alcohol and substances when asked postpartum. However, due to a high index of suspicion, meconium test confirmed that alcohol was consumed in pregnancy and later revealed that mom is a problem drinker that was unknown to both the GP or the ob -GYN. So before we start discussing the tool, we'd like to do a refresher on alcohol and pregnancy. Um, up to 12% of women reported drinking throughout their pregnancies, according to Health Canada. And of these, 1.4% reported binge drinking. Now, these are just the women who actually reported it. So there, there's a vast number more that probably drinks without reporting. Um, healthcare providers have... Uh, have through various survey studies, themselves reported that they do not systematically screen all women of childbearing age or pregnant women on their consumption of alcohol, and women themselves has, have reported this through various survey studies. Now, when we discuss alcohol use in pregnancy, it's very important to understand what type of drinking takes place. When we think of alcohol use and women who drink, we are not talking about the alcoholics and alcohol dependent women. Yes, there are those. However, the vast number of women who consume alcohol do so uh, by engaging in what is known as problem drinking behavior. Problem drinking behavior refers to the amount of maternal drinking that is associated with harm to the fetus. And the NIAAA uh, criteria for this is known as more than three drinks at one sitting or more than seven drinks per week. So this is a type of drinking that's very easily missed by most care providers because women do not appear or give the appearance of um, alcohol-related problems as alcoholics or alcohol-dependent women do. They have full-time jobs, they have high-functioning lifestyles, etc. Obviously, when one is pregnant or planning, any amount of drinking can be considered risky for women. So how do we combat this problem of continued alcohol use, even though there's such a vast amount of uh, literature suggesting it is a known and established strategy? Simply by routinely screening, making screening universal, by asking all women of childbearing age about their alcohol use and drug use, and of course, especially planning or pregnant women. By advising all these women, regardless of whether their response is yes or no to alcohol, uh, and informing them that no alcohol is the safest choice, and for women who do report consuming alcohol in pregnancy or prior to their knowledge of pregnancy to contact services such as Mother Risk or other uh, uh, information services about what the effects may have been to the unborn fetus. And finally, it's not enough just to simply ask and inform, but also to assist all these women to con discontinue their drinking via counseling, care, and most importantly, referral to the next dip um, for whichever program or services are most appropriate to them. So the reason that this guide was developed is for um, two reasons. The first is obviously to identify all the women who of childbearing age who drinks at a problem drinking level and women who continue their alcohol consumption in pregnancy. 
and this can be done via a positive screen on uh, an indirect tool such as the tweet or by simply asking how much and how often and seeing if the amount that they drink meets the NIAAA guidelines for a problem drinker. The second purpose of the maternal drinking tool guide is to obtain and document the accurate amount of alcohol that was consumed by the mom and this information and knowledge is critical because not only will it help to identify women who are at risk and hence put in place harm reduction strategies for both herself and her unborn fetus, but also um, because this information that has been documented is critical for uh, future FASD diagnosis of the child, even if mom is not in the picture. So what are the benefits of this tool? Well, first and foremost, this guide is based, every single screening method that's included in this is based on a validated methodology and has been found to be an effective means of eliciting maternal alcohol use. Secondly, it provides practitioners with several different options so that they can choose what is most appropriate for the type of practice they have as well as the population that they care for. Thirdly, there's really no training or expertise that are really required to screen for any of these um, methods, and so anyone can employ it to save time in a clinical setting. And finally, it's very each of these options that are included are very easily integrated into standardized health questionnaires, among other innocuous questions related to lifestyle. When do we employ this, not, this drinking guide? Well, essentially at any visit. When the first time of any woman, uh, any woman of childbearing age presents in your practice, it's important to assess for their alcohol use and ask questions. Um, and subsequent visit, whether it's at a physician's place, whether it's an addiction center, whether it's at a um, you know, healthcare center, any subsequent visit, they should be always asked about their alcohol use so it becomes a very simple question as any other lifestyle question is. If a woman is planning or pregnant, then every preconception visit and subsequent visit during pregnancy, they should be asked about their alcohol use and uh, screened for it. So there are three different levels of screening that has been included as part of this guide. The first and simplest of which that should be used at every visit and at very minimum asked among other questions is the practice-based screening. This includes a single question to identify whether alcohol is a part of her lifestyle or not. So this is not to ask whether she's a problem drinker or not, it's simply to identify does she drink or does she not. And by employing motivational interviewing techniques and supportive dialogue to ask this one question, there has been shown to be a very high effective means of obtaining accurate answer from women of childbearing age. The second level of screening is that of the structured questionnaire. Structured questionnaires have been found to be uh, quite effective as well. This type of screening includes both a direct method of questioning by asking how much and how often, as well as an indirect or masked method of screening by using brief screening questionnaires such as TASTE or TWEAK, which have been validated for pregnant women themselves. And this, is, this second level identifies whether they're problem drinkers or not. The third and more, most precise method of identifying alcohol use in pregnancy is that of the lab-based screening methods. And there are several methods of which hair and meconium I, the testing for fatty acid ethyl esters would be the most accurate method um, of identifying alcohol use and confirming it. It is also to be used in very limited situations because it is expensive and um, it, it, it's usually used when there's child protection agencies that are involved. So coming back to the case that I initially um, presented, uh, infant was born at 35 weeks of gestation, um, medical history 
failed to reveal anything uh, that mom uh, was exposed to that could speak to baby's symptoms. Patient, when asked, denied her use of any alcohol and substances. However, due to a high index of suspicion and upon consent, meconium test for fatty acid ethyl ester was used and confirmed that alcohol exposure did occur during the pregnancy. Um, and later, it was revealed that mom is a problem drinker. However, uh, this was unknown to any both practitioners because the question was never asked and revealed. So how do we address screening for a patient such as this? The most important um, thing to remember when a woman comes and presents at a clinical setting is to, make, is to make sure that she feels inclusive. So we can start off by an introductory statement that, um, that such as, I want to ask you a series of questions today about your lifestyle. I ask all my patients these questions because it really helps me to get to know you better and provide better care. Now, upon asking this question, a second question that we find at Mother Risk very helpful and very revealing is one that is quite harmless and yet tells us a lot, and that is, when did you find out or suspect you were pregnant? If she responds, oh, not until my 16th week or 18th week of pregnancy, that would suggest that either she has irregular periods or she simply wasn't keeping track of her pregnancy or she might lead a quite a volatile lifestyle, which is why she never kept track of her pregnancy. But most importantly, what it would suggest is that if she does consume alcohol, she would have continued her normal lifestyle until she recognized her pregnancy. So her risk is greater than someone else who might have found out within the first month of pregnancy. So going from that introductory statement to the next screening question, which is the level one screening, which is a single question to find out and identify if alcohol is part of her lifestyle or not. Um, it is very important to embed this one question among other standard innocuous questions related to lifestyle that you would normally ask your patients. For example, any one of these three questions that are related to alcohol. Do you ever enjoy a drink or two? When was the last time? Do you sometimes drink beer, wine, or alcoholic beverages? Or in the past month or so, have you ever enjoyed a drink or two? Any one of these questions, whichever you're most comfortable with, can be incorporated among other innocuous questions related to lifestyle that you might normally ask, such as, so do you take any prenatal vitamins, or do you smoke any cigarettes at all? If so, how many? What about medications? Do you exercise? How much? And upon um, asking that question and then identifying, yes, she might respond, I do enjoy a drink or two once in a while. The next step would be to identify whether or not she is a, a risk drinker. And to do that, we would employ brief questionnaires. And this has been found to be the most effective method of screening for um, harmful drinking in pregnancy. They're quick, practical, efficient, and cost-effective. There's either you might choose to do a direct line of questioning, which is the timeline follow-back tool, where you can ask the patient, okay, so now that you've revealed you do enjoy a drink or two, how often do you, would you say in a week you would drink? Would you enjoy week weekends? Um, how many times over the weekends? And how much on each time? Or you could go by an indirect or masked method of questioning. And this can be the taste or the tweak. They have been designed to overcome issues of possible underreporting. And this, this method of indirect screening can be used in situations where you're not very familiar with the patient or you find that the patient is someone that, um, you know, you have, they, they're not answering their questions very openly and you're not comfortable asking them about their alcohol use. Here is an example of the tweet questionnaire. It's made up of five different questions related to tolerance, worry, eye opener, um, amnesia, and cutting down on their drinking. So a question such as, 
How many drinks did it take you to make your first make you feel the first effect of alcohol before you knew you were pregnant? By wording it prior to pregnancy, they're less they're more likely to um, respond to you accurately because they don't have the guilt associated with drinking in pregnancy. And so if they respond to you, oh, it took me at least three or more drinks, at least four drinks to feel the first buzz, then you would appoint her two points. Similarly, a positive response to any of the subsequent four response would score her either two points or one point out of a total of seven. So if a patient scores two or more out of seven, she's then considered a um, risk drinker. So going from being a risk drinker, the third level of screening, which as I mentioned before, is the most um, accurate form of confirming alcohol use in pregnancy. However, it is also invasive and should really be limited to cases where there is a high index of suspicion or whether where level one and two do not, um, did not uh, work out or there is still a high level of suspicion as in this case scenario. Uh, it, of course, this should be done only with mother's consent or if the child is a ward of the CAS or Child Protection Agency involved, then they have the right to um, ask for this level of screening. And this can be done with a meconium test or a hair test. And it's a, it's a type of screening that is only done in the postpartum. And this knowledge is very valuable, whether she did drink or not, because in the future, if mom is not around, um, and the child presents with a certain deficit, then FASD assessment is possible. Because as we all know, for an FASD assessment to occur, it is mandatory that there is some sort of documentation that um, is available to confirm that mom did drink in pregnancy. So in this case report, postpartum, if mom denied use, and there is no meconium test uh, that was done to confirm that alcohol use was uh, alcohol was used in pregnancy, then this child would not have been able to have an assessment done. Of course, in addition to confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure, a referral by a doctor and assessment involving physical, neurological, psychiatric, and genetic examination would also be done. Now, screening and intervention is very, very important. Why? Because the earlier diagnosis is done for the child, the earlier interventions can be put in place. And there's a surmountable amount of evidence out there to show that the earlier stimulation is provided to the child in question, the better they do in the future in how they carry their lifestyle, how they hold down their jobs. Um, etc. It's also very, very important to screen and identify these women because it's important to remember that there are not just one patient involved, but two patients, the pregnant woman herself or the mother who's just given birth herself. Simply forgetting about her and taking care of the child is not, is, is not ethical because she's a patient herself. So it's very important to put harm reduction strategies in place for her so that she can get better and take care of the child as well. Now, this is a second case scenario. Um, BJ has been your patient for a year. She's very private and can be both defensive and combative by nature. She has a five-year-old child with both developmental and behavioral issues. She's now pregnant and has previously never been asked about her alcohol use. During her prenatal screening, um, her provider asks, I'm sure you know alcohol and pregnancy don't go well together. Um, you're, you're not drinking, are you? She responds, no. A um, few weeks later, however, her partner comes to the provider and mentions his concern for her continued drinking in pregnancy. So again, how would this case be approached? Well, in this case, a similar introductory statement should be um, introduced with, I want to ask you a series of questions today about your lifestyle. I ask all my patients these questions because it really helps me to get to know you better and provide better care for your pregnancy. And following that, um, the question related to how, uh, when did you suspect you were pregnant would be important. 
and then a single method of screening, um, even if it's for the first time that it's being asked among other questions, it's never too late to ask now that she's pregnant, which is, do you ever enjoy a drink or two? When was the last time it, that you had a drink? Um, in the past month or so, have you enjoyed a drink or two among other innocuous questions? Now in this case, uh, the important thing to understand is when the question was asked, it's, it's very essential that not the, the question should be asked in a manner that does not deter her or push her to answer no, which this clearly is. Um, and so we're going to discuss how motivational interviewing techniques and supportive dialogue can help in eliciting an accurate response. So for example, avoid questions that suggest you want a negative response. You don't drink, do you? That is obviously a very wrong way of asking that question. A more positive frame would be, many women wind down the day with a glass of wine or a few drinks on a night out. Do you ever enjoy or sometimes enjoy a drink or two? Avoiding many closed or dead-ended questions is also important. Um, what would be negative is, do you drink since you found out? Yes or no? Rather, sorry, rather it would be important to ask, how has your alcohol consumption evolved since you found out you're pregnant? A, I continue my usual habit. B, I have cut down. Or C, I'm trying to abstain, but I find it difficult. It's also important to not um, to provide open-ended question because that would um, that would help her speak her mind. So if she wants to say something, she can have an open dialogue rather than a yes or no question. Supportive dialogue um, without any moral connotation and empathetic listening is also important. For example, can you tell me a bit about your drinking pattern before you knew you were pregnant? Or have you been able to stop or cut down since you found out? If alcohol problem is suspected but denied, it's important to engage women to improve their trust. And so a statement such as, well, you know, it's, rec it, it's recommended to abstain from alcohol during pregnancy. Now, if you're having a hard time stopping, which many women do, or even if you drink occasionally, please do not hesitate to discuss it with me. Now, upon identifying their alcohol use, it's also important to advise and provide feedback. If the screening is positive, or report, or she reports continued prenatal alcohol use, or someone else does, then you can begin the process by saying, well, here's some information that has been learned through research. I'd really like to share it with you, if I may. What is your understanding about alcohol use in pregnancy? Again, opening it up so that she can relate to you what she understands about it. She might have heard several different things about it. Her grandmother may have drank um, and she might say, well, my grandmother, my aunt, everyone drinks. It's a part of our culture, so it's not really a big deal. Then you can understand where she's coming from and then having the opportunity to report to her what the current literature says and why it's important to not drink at all. Or ask her, do you have any questions about your alcohol use? It's also very important to provide feedback that allows clients to compare their behavior to others so that they know how their behavior relates to national norms. And so a statement such as, well, many women drink on a regular basis, and since half of all pregnancies are unplanned, many women are exposed to alcohol prior to their pregnancy knowledge. Do you mind if we spend a few minutes talking about this, or would you be interested in learning more about this? So there are several recommendations for screening and for universal screening to take place, these are very, very important. It's very important that we as practitioners and people that are caring for women who are, are of childbearing age um, really drill into them that being asked about alcohol and other drug use is not something to be scared of. So the, the more often we ask, the earlier we ask, from the time that they present 
um, as a child bearing age, um, if they're asked about their alcohol and drug use as much and as often as they're asked about their diet or their exercise or their medical conditions, women will then learn not to be afraid of this question. And that is the key, is to ask and ask and ask from the first time. Um, so they're, they're used to it. Uh, so during regular health exams, healthcare providers should use the standardized questions that includes at least, at the very least, the practice-based screening question. So one question related to alcohol use. And early identification and reduction of maternal drinking can then be made possible. It and also, after asking every one of these questions, it's also important to inform these women that no known safe limit of there's really no safe limit for alcohol use when they're pregnant um, and explain to them why that is and what the data has shown. Secondly, level two screening, which is to identify problem drinking in pregnancy or risk drinking in pregnancy, should be adopted as standard screening process to identify alcohol use of um, all women of childbearing age, but especially pregnant women. And finally, um, upon screening, women need to be linked to services if required by their providers. <clears throat> the take-home message really is, is that healthcare providers' role in harm reduction is vital. And really, pregnancy is a time when most women are very willing to. It's a time when they're most um, willing to make a change in their lifestyle where they're thinking about someone else other than themselves. So advising patients and informing them about their alcohol use and that the safest choice is not to consume alcohol in pregnancy is vital. Adequate resources should always be made available to women requiring interventions beyond the primary interaction and recording of maternal alcohol use in newborns' birth records and child health records is also very important. The earlier identification takes place and subsequent um, diagnosis can occur so that harm reduction strategies can be put into place and interventions can occur for the child. Here are several FASD programs and resources. Uh, there's the Mother Risk Alcohol and Substance Use Helpline um, where you can go or send your patients to if they have been exposed to alcohol or drug use and they want information on where they can go to to um, stop it or what the, what the risk may have occurred for their unborn child. Um, some women simply need to hear that this is what is going to happen for them to uh, serve, for, for, for it to serve as motivation to not take the next drink. So there are women that will call mother risk program and say, you know, I know it's bad, but I just need to hear what the effects are so that it'll help me not take the next drink. Best Start um, is also another very, uh, very good program that provides online training for screening for alcohol use. It has a wealth of research on it. There's the CCSA that you can um, have written information mailed into you, and there's a wealth of information on their website. There's the Prima Alberta Health Services and Healthy Choices in Pregnancy in BC. I'd like to acknowledge um, Dr. Corin, um, uh, the Mother Risk Alcohol and Substance Use Helpline counselors, the task force, the steering committee on the screening tool, the CAP. CAPHC and the Public Health, Ages Health Agency of Canada. Thank you very much, and I'll be open to questions. Thanks, Momita. We, uh, we, uh, we, we haven't had any questions come in, but that's certainly our, my, my chance to remind the audience that, that, that this is your opportunity to type in any questions. Um, we did have a uh, few poll questions, uh, Momita. If you, uh, do you think this would be a good time to run those? Uh, yes, if you could put that on. That sure. Would be great. All right. So yeah. So we're going to run a, a few polls just about uh, some of the information that you've you've uh, you've just uh, seen. So what you're going to see is up on your screen. You're going to see the poll questions uh, up on your screen, and all you have to do is click on uh, the screen to make your selection as to which one. Uh, so the question is based on your type of practice. Which screening technique that you heard about today will work best for you? Practice based, 
level one, direct Q&F questions, level two, indirect uh, tweak and TH tools, which is level three or none of the above. So we'll give everyone a chance to sort of ponder that for a second as, uh, as um, people are entering their answers. And we just had a question come in about uh, whether the slides would be available. And yes, the slides will be available. Uh, following this, as will the uh, actual audio visual recording of uh, of this session, will be also made available on the knowledge on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, uh, which is at uh, ken.ken.org. So we'll just give everyone another couple seconds to uh, get their answers in. All right, it looks like most of the responses are in, so we'll close uh, this off. Oh, a couple more answers came in there. All right, so we'll close that off. We'll just have a look at what the audience said. So it looks like the most popular is the level one practice-based at 41%, followed by the direct QF questions, followed by indirect, and then very few said none of the above. All right, so we'll just hide that. And this question is similar, but a little bit different. Um, this question is asking which screening technique in uh, this maternal drinking guide tool are you most comfortable using and hence most likely to implement? And this one you can check all that apply. So we do have uh, the extra question of, uh, of hair and meconium testing or the extra response choice of hair and meconium testing that was not in the previous one. That's pretty much everybody. So we'll close this one off. And so this one, as opposed to a single uh, answer option, this was uh, multiple. You could choose all that applied. So again, the most popular is the practice based in the same order, followed by direct QF, uh, then followed by indirect tweak and TA tools, uh, and then followed by um, hair and meconium testing at 19%. All right. So we have one more question. Uh, as part of this uh, research program, we do want to do uh, to continue to monitor the sort of the uptake and the use of this tool. So we're wondering if uh, we can contact you in six months to find out uh, uh, with a short survey to find out how useful these approaches have been. Um, following the uh, previous uh, time we did this this webinar or presented this topic, uh, we did a short survey. It's very short, just asking you a few questions about you know how you how basically asking how you uh, use it if you're using the tool and how you're using it and get a sense of how valuable it is. All right, it's good to see. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds to enter a choice. It's good to see some people are saying yes, at least. All right. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll close this off. Looks like more than half of you are saying yes. So uh, that, that's good. So we'll be in touch uh, using probably using the email address that we uh, used uh, to contact you about this, this webinar. Uh, you'll be receiving a, a short survey in in, a, in, a, in approximately six months. We have had a few uh, questions come in. Uh, so, uh, Omita, we'll uh, start firing these your way. Uh, Christina is asking, uh, what suggestion do you have regarding incorporating screening for alcohol into antenatal records? I think that is that is what is <laughs> it that's key basically to this um, there was a review that uh, we had done uh, a project with SOGC and PHAC and where we reviewed uh, this was about four or five years ago and we realized there were only four provinces uh, or four or five provinces that even included um, a question related to alcohol use in their provincial antenatal records so it uh, or it, it was it really shed a lot of light on this um, and so the standard practice should be that at least one of these questions practice based questions should be part of the provincial records does that answer the question 
uh, if it doesn't, uh, Christina, please feel, and anyone else who asks a question, if we don't quite uh, get your question, oh, she did say yes, thank you. Yes, always feel free to type in a follow-up uh, as the answer is coming in if we're not quite uh, interpreting your question properly. But Christina has said yes, that that did answer her question. So we'll move on to the next question, which is from Tatiana. And she's asking, she said, first she said, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, she goes on to say, could you tell uh, some more about the level two screening? How do you how do you decide when to go to level two? How do you ask the level two questions? What questions do you ask? A standard TLFB is time consuming. Uh, do you have another way to ask level two questions? Okay, that is actually a very good question, and unfortunately, for some reason, um, <laughs> I had an algorithm that is part of the screening tool, which would be part in the CAPSI website. You can access it, um, but in this presentation, it wasn't showing up. But the algorithm has a very um, clear flowchart of when it should be used and what questions should be used. So I'll verbally try and um, explain it to you. So the first level would be an introductory statement, which uh, I reviewed with you. With uh, you know, I ask all these patients. Then once the level one practice-based screening is done where patient has been asked the question and you have identified that yes alcohol is part of her lifestyle that's the main purpose of the level one screening simply to identify does she drink or does she not it doesn't matter whether she binges whether she's addicted to alcohol whether she has drank one drink in all year the whole point is simply to identify if alcohol is something that is part of her lifestyle at all and so if that is positive then you then go on to level two screening which is the brief questionnaires and you're right the timeline follow back tool in its entirety is very very time consuming and so if that is not something you're comfortable with and it's not always feasible then the direct question would be um, if the comfort level is there simply what we do at mother is for example is we ask about the past seven days of use um, so we frame it in such that it was prior to pregnancy or just prior to her knowledge of pregnancy more accurately and say well before you knew you were pregnant can you give me an idea of what how much you drank over the past seven days and say well you know normally for example I might go out and have uh, three or four drinks on a Saturday or and Sunday um, but during the week I don't have more than one drink with dinner between Monday and Thursday and then encourage the, the birth mother then to say the patient sitting there to say well what would your pattern be in terms of your drinking in a week um, and she might say oh no I have a lot more over the weekends but during the week I don't touch anything and so that way you can say oh, okay like what would you say on a weekend between Friday Saturday and Sunday how much drinks would you have and during the weekdays how many would you have on each day and that way you have an idea of how much she drinks in the total span of seven days and if she says that she, if she, at any point while she's talking she reports um, oh I'll have you know three to four drinks on Saturday you know that that's and you re she reveals to you that that's at one sitting then you know that she's already qualified as a harmful drinker because according to NIAAA criteria or guidelines um, to us it might not seem like a, 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 a huge amount however based on the criteria she would be identified as um, a, as a risk drinker because according to the criteria three or more drinks at one sitting or more than seven drinks in a week so when we come to the direct questioning once she's identified the next step would be to say oh, okay that's you know we all enjoy a drink or two who doesn't um, so how, how can you give me an idea of during the week how many times in a week you drink and how much at each sitting and that one simple question should be able to give you an idea of whether she is a risk drinker or not um, and if you're not comfortable asking direct questions about the alcohol then you can start off by saying well you know 
everyone, in, like yourself, everyone enjoys a drink or two. And usually we like to get an idea of what a woman's tolerance is to alcohol. We all have different tolerance to alcohols. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions through a tool called the tweak tool or if you choose the taste tool and then you can start by asking so before you're pregnant how what would you say like how many drinks would it have taken you to feel the first effect of alcohol and if she says oh I needed to drink at least six or seven drinks automatically you know this is someone who's a heavy drinker for her to feel the first buzz at five or six or seven drinks um, if she, and that way you're going through each of the five questions on the tweak tool and identifying if she's a harmful um, drinker or not. And you're phrasing it prior to knowledge of pregnancy so that guilt is not associated um, with her during pregnancy. And of course, if it's a woman who's planning, then it's not a problem at all. You should be able to ask her direct questions about her alcohol and drug use and uh, it should be fine. I hope that has answered the question. Question, uh, and actually a couple of people have, have uh, asked this question, so I'm going to um, let me just bring my screen up. Uh, a number of people are asking where they can get access to the tweak or the TA screening tools. Um, and I just wanted to pop up, as I mentioned a couple of times, the, the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can, you know, as I mentioned, the, the URL. The uh, If you just use the search box, you can find the uh, screening tool kit, uh, which is posted up there. And it, that has all of our uh, screening tools, uh, including the maternal drinking guide, which is down here. And if you just click the tool document uh, here, that'll bring up a document that has... Uh, much of the information, including uh, the, the tweak and, and how to, and the instructions on how to use it, etc. Um, I don't know if the, the TAs, I don't think, is in this document. Is it, Momita? Um, it was originally. They may have taken it. Uh, it was included. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's in there. Then. Yeah. It, and if not, it's not a problem. Um, I can, if when I send the slides over, I can include the taste along with it. Okay. All right. Um, so again, all this information, uh, including the, 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 the recording of this session, this is the website I was referring to, uh, which is where it will be posted. Uh, the next uh, question is asking, Mary is asking, can you comment on the length of time you would recommend a woman should abstain from breastfeeding after, she says breastfeeding after on standard drink. I'm not, might be a spelling mistake in there. Um, but she goes on to say, most recommend at a minimum of two standard drinks. However, the research that has been done indicates that a woman who weighs less than 180 pounds would take longer than two hours to eliminate alcohol from breast milk after consuming one standard drink. Uh, could you repeat the last part of the question? A woman who weighs... Weighs less than 180 pounds would take longer than two hours to eliminate alcohol from breast milk after consuming one standard drink. Okay. Okay. So basically this is... We get about, I would say, no less than eight calls a day on alcohol use in breastfeeding in at mother risk. And um, we actually have a chart that has been developed that um, I recommend all of you okay, uh, healthcare providers to have because it's a very easy chart. It goes by um, mom's birth weight and underneath on the x-axis is how long it would take per standard drink for the time it would take to uh, for the alcohol to be eliminated down to zero. So there is a it, it's a very clear chart, very easy to follow, and I, I can't remember the exact weight and how long to wait, but basically the idea is the less weight a mom has, the more the longer she has to wait. The heavier the mom is, the shorter the time she has to wait. And it's in the range between one and a half hours to two and a half hours. So um, per standard drink, and by standard drink, I'm referring to a bottle of beer, a shot of liquor, 40%, uh, a glass of wine, um, you know, a, a bottle of cooler. So they all contain the same amount of alcohol and is equal to one standard drink. And that chart of how much alcohol and what type of alcohol is on that chart as well. You can access that chart both from 
um, Motherist website as well as from the Best Start website. And it's simply called, I believe it's um, uh, Time to Zero Level in Breast Milk. So it basically gives the waiting time per drink. So if a woman, for example, is 120 pounds um, and she has one drink, I believe the time is about an hour and 45 minutes or an hour and 50 minutes. Um, sorry, two hours and 20 minutes. It's longer. Uh, but don't quote me on this. I really don't have the chart in front of me, but that chart is very clear. And uh, if, you know, uh, it, it's very, it, it's available on those two websites. All right, thanks. Mary did put a follow-up in, and she said that the chart is great, but what she struggles with is a static recommendation of two hours being printed in the liter in literature as she wonders if that puts women who weigh less at, at a higher risk of exposing their child to alcohol. Yeah, I, I don't know where, um, I mean, we, I, I can't comment as to where they put two hours, but you're right. Um, it shouldn't be a standard two-hour wait, um, especially if, you know, if they're having four or five drinks, then, you know, it's not, it's much longer wait. And so it does add up in terms of uh, the difference between 10 hours and uh, 8 hours. So that is something that uh, I'm not comfortable with as well. And that is why I, it would, at the end of two hours, it's true that a woman who weighs less um, will still have some milk, alcohol in her milk remaining. However, the amount would be much less than at one and a half hours or at one hour. So that's the only reassuring thing that I can think of. But the time that is stated in this chart is for there to be no alcohol at all versus a little bit left. All right. Thank you. Um, Christina's asking, what educational or knowledge translation uh, strategies uh, would you suggest to enhance healthcare provider self-efficacy to provide alcohol screening and counseling? For example, training methods or strategies for healthcare providers. Um, that's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, we've tried to do this. We've tried several webinars for um, especially, you know, general practitioners, physicians, um, I think they're the most difficult um, to kind of train because they don't have the time or they have their own way or they're concerned about, you know, deterring or not having the patients come back to them, um, which is why universal screening is so important. So in terms of effective, what, you know, we believe would be effective would really be for them to understand this is why this guide was created because we were trying to keep in mind that all these barriers that were reported by healthcare providers, the time and the, the concern of which is the most effective tool and not having enough options that would be appropriate for their practice would be, can be overcome. And so hopefully this guide will serve as something, but the most important thing would simply be to get everyone to start asking at least one question about alcohol. And once the culture becomes such where women are used to being asked about their alcohol use as they are about their exercise or diet, then we can then move on to identifying those who are actually at risk. But there's really not much training in terms of asking one simple question. It's more a matter of, you know, the willingness to do it. So um, books have not been found to be effective. Um, you know, edu we know that medical schools have less than one day of training about alcohol use in pregnancy and FASD. So it's really something that it amazes me to this day that it's one of the leading, it's the most, you know, uh, preventable form of brain damage, yet it, it's, women are still continuing to drink because the information out there still seems to be mixed. There are still care providers out there that are telling women that it's okay for them to have a glass here and there 
if they're nervous or anxious because it's not good for them to be nervous or anxious. So it, a lot of it has to do with the willingness from the provider's part to take the time and really um, spend it on women of childbearing age and you know, get this culture going on asking questions about alcohol. All right. Uh, there are uh, there have been a number of comments uh, where people have identified pl- various places where uh, people can find uh, the tweak in the taste uh, information uh, from the Best Start website, which is beststart.org, B-E-S-T-S-T-A-R-T, all one word, dot org, which is, uh, I believe, the Ontario uh, government's website. Uh, a number of people also suggested the National Institute of Alcohol on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in the United States uh, also has a number of these resources on their website as well. So a number, in addition to the information that you can find on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network there. So lots of opportunities just to, to find them just uh, with quick searches. So, um, so the next question uh, from Mary is she, she's asking if you, if you can comment on the importance of uh, thinning, thinning? thinning of postpartum women as being in the preconception period and the need to think about alcohol consumption in the postpartum period. Thinking, sorry, there, thank you. The importance of thinking of postpartum women as being in the preconception period and the need to think about alcohol consumption in the postpartum period to protect a successive pregnancy. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, And it's, (laughs) it's, it's, it's the question that you know all at all these alcohol conferences we struggle with every time is how do we get people to recognize that there are two patients that there's the mom and simply by taking her child away is not going to solve the problem because she's just going to be upset and go on drink again get pregnant again and it's going to be the same story repeated over and over again um I guess the only, like right now, compared to 10 years ago, there's been a lot more um, resources and money put in place for uh, not just caring for the child, uh, but also to look at harm reduction strategies for mom herself. Um, Nothing has become a standard practice. There is no form, and I guess that's the next step, but the, the predicament lies in the fact that there are many women who simply come, deliver, and move on. And um, the first step is, and these women are never heard from again, so the first step, again, this is why screening becomes so important, is that we need to identify these women during pregnancy when we're still in contact with them, when there's the room to get them the help, to care for them, to help them understand that they're not alone, and you know, tell them that your child won't be taken. A lot of women don't report to you simply because they're scared that their child will be taken away. But if they can be identified early on in the pregnancy, get the help they get, that way they're not only, they can be sent to a, um, a residential home during the pregnancy, so not only are they free of alcohol during the pregnancy, but they're also um, taken, they've also taken the first step to do what is necessary for them to keep the baby. And nothing serves as more of a motivator than to tell a pregnant woman that, you know, your child will not be taken away if you stay away from alcohol and if you clean yourself up. So, um, again, it all comes back to being identified knowing that the patient, you know, is is having problems discontinuing her alcohol or drug use and getting her the help, putting the referrals in place during everything done during the pregnancy so that by the time the baby is delivered and the baby, um, you know, both mom and child can be helped. So as of this point, there is nothing standard that's been put in place where you know we 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 basically leave it up to the birth mother to say, you know, there's this help in place. Would you want it? But most of them are not in a position at that point to want the help. 
um because all they're looking for is you know their next drink or their next hit so um it's very important to get to them earlier on in the pregnancy so that everything can be put in place so that the subsequent pregnancies don't all right uh, the next question is just asking, in your experience, have you seen any advantages of using the tweak versus the taste? Um, well, in terms of the tweak over the taste, both of them are on its own been found to be very highly specific and uh, sensitive. The tweak um, is what we use at Mother Risk for a number of different reasons. It's basically because the population that we see is very racially diverse. Um, we're based out of Toronto, so it's a very highly multicultural environment, and most of our calls come from Ontario, and Canada as a country is very racially, ethnically diverse. So um, the tweak has been found over the taste to be highly much more highly sensitive and more importantly specific when it comes to addressing a racially diverse group all right and we do have one more question so if anyone else has a question uh, please type it in uh, as quickly as you can otherwise we may wrap up uh, shortly after this next question um, and this question might be a little bit beyond uh, the scope of this particular webinar but uh, Christina is asking what about screening in the postpartum period for example six weeks postpartum you did mention um, you know meconium screening and that sort of thing and I will before you answer I'll just again direct people's attention to the Knowledge Exchange Network where we have a host of webinars about the other screening tools which are focused on various uh, populations and age groups, etc. But uh, Momita, you, did you want to comment on that at all as far as screening in the post postpartum period? Absolutely. Screening in postpartum should be, screening should be done at any opportunity that presents itself. That's the whole point is that whether it's Pre, of, of course, preconception is ideal. Um, women at the age of 15, when they start coming in to see their doctor, that's when really it should start, asking about their alcohol or drug use, 15, 16 years of age. Um, that's when it should begin. But even postpartum, screening should be done. There have been actually two or three studies, survey studies, where women were asked themselves um, about, you know, being asked and women responded that if they had been asked about their alcohol use at any point during pregnancy, they would have responded that they drank. If the question is not asked, they are not going to answer. So whether it's postpartum or during pregnancy, um, very important, any level of screening should be conducted. All right, and I think that concludes uh, the question and answer period. Uh, Elaine, did you have any uh, final comments you wanted to uh, add to the session before we wrap this up? I'd love to, Doug. Thank you. Um, Momita, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, so insightful, and, and uh, your presentation style is, is, is really outstanding. Thank you. And I want to thank the participants for all of your engagement. Um, that's really why we do these webinars, is to try and connect with as many people as possible across our very uh, broad community on, on topics that are very important uh, to us. I, uh, I want to uh, just mention, and, and it comes with a little bit of an apology, we had another colleague and member of our national FASE team online with us, and that is Unji Kim from the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, Unji was actually our presenter of our maternal drinking guide en français um, uh, several months ago, and, and we are hoping to, we are planning to repeat that again. And uh, I just want to thank Unji for a being with us today uh, online, as well as your leadership and contribution to our work. And um, once again, um, uh, I guess in terms of the poll response, uh, thank you to uh, the majority of, of participants today for agreeing to be contacted for that second follow-up uh, survey that we talked about. That's a very important part of our uh, development and uh, bringing, making that tool better and stronger. So um, I, uh, I thank everyone for that as well. 
All right. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, you know, I'll add my thanks to that as well, Momita. It was a great presentation. We've had a number of comments coming in uh, that, 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 saying that they also agree that this was an excellent presentation. So, uh, you know, thanks again. And uh, thank you to everyone else. If you do ha uh, have uh, any other questions or, you know, don't hesitate to contact us by email. And if you are interested in participating in any of our upcoming webinars, you can always go to our main website at CAFC.org. The webinar program is called CAFC Presents. Um, so if you just uh, find that program, it'll uh, give you a nice calendar of all of the upcoming events, including uh, webinars uh, related to the FASD screening work that we do, but not limited to that. So uh, we hope to see you on some of our future webinars. And uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk soon. All right, bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, Doug. Bye. Bye.